Welcome everyone to another episode of Kiwi Talks. My guest today is an acting veteran with over 20 years of experience. You might know him best for his role as Wamba in The Hobbit, but he's also an acting coach, a voiceover artist, radio host, comedian. Basically, he can do everything. I'd like to welcome uh, Stephen Hunter. How you doing? Thank you. And also, Mulu fan. <laughs> I've, um, I got that when I was... Uh, you can tell his Waikato rug because he's got a livestock improvement thing. So yeah. Probably an old one. When I was working at Radio Sport um, with Marty Devlin, um, who I just caught up with, actually. Um, you know, he's, he's, a, he's had a tough year, right? And uh, he, he looks amazing. And I think because I was supporting uh, the Mulus and, and the Chiefs while we were doing the radio show, they sent me like a jumper and they sent me a, um, a bell. So there we go. Uh, but thank you. It's uh, really good to be here. And uh, as you can see, I'm wearing the... Uh, I'm sporting, I'm sporting the, uh, the stuff. <laughs> used to do conventions and people would just make these things. And if you... I fucking... You can see the other side. You can see it says... Oh, um, Bomber Squad. Bomber Squad, yeah. Nice. So so there we go. And I don't get to wear it very often, so I thought, well... Yeah, why not? Um, and then, then my other my other fandom is you can... I don't know if you can read the hat. Tatooine, um, nice. Ta Tatooine National Park. Um, there's a great place, and I'll give them a plug because I don't really know them, but um, <laughs> it's called Busted Tees. And, and you, you just hire, you know, hats, T-shirts, and I'm a massive... You probably can't see because I've blurred out because I've got so much... Um, so much shit in my room, but um, I've got a whole. Um, where am I? Uh, I'm just going to try and change my background so you can probably see it. You can probably see there. Oh, yeah. There's a whole lot. There's, there's the cups, there's the Millennium Falcon, there's Yoda, there's the ATAT. Um, and that there, I don't know if you can see it just briefly. There's a, it's actually a, a one six scale model of um, uh, Obi Wan Kenobi. Um, through this outfit called Sideshow, and I, we, we did a like a we did an online game show with them. There was myself and John Callan, and um, actually my, my office isn't too bad. I think I'm gonna leave it like yeah, this. Yeah, yeah, um, looks good. With with uh, with John Callan and William Kircher, and we had to do a pose with these things. Um, anyway, they sent me one of those, and we we I've got a full like a six scale um, Gandalf. But the cool thing about the Obi Wan Kenobi one is that it's it's the you think it's you and uh, McGregor, because it's that age of Obi Wan Kenobi. But when you look at the features, they've actually they've actually reversed aged Alec Guinness. So it's and it's like whoa. Oh. You know, and I'm, I'm a I'm a mega fan. So uh, yes. so did did you advocate to try and get into the new Obi Wan show that they've oh, all <laughs> like always, you know? And it's 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 funny because you're always trying to get into something. I'm always trying to do that. I'm always wanting to get into a Will Ferrell film or something. But um, you know, it's just, it's really what's cast and who's casting what. And I always get asked the question, you know, sort of what, what sort of films do you like to do? Or what sort of projects do you like to do? And, you know, as if people think I've got like a whole <laughs> lot of things I can choose from. And I'm just like, mate, I just do whatever I get offered pretty much. Um, or, and apologies for my wardrobe door because we had, I don't know, we had torrential rain like the last three or four weeks in Sydney. And that door literally just fell off. It's got a mirror attached wow. to it. It's been so wet here. Um, my family were literally, you know, in jandals and, and raincoats shoveling down the side path to try and clear the water because it was up like that high in our garage. Yeah. And it, was, it, was, it was pretty, like, we were lucky because we're, we're, in, we're in the Lower North Shore, which is actually, it's, we're actually quite high up where we are. Um, Queensland copped a lot of it. Lismore copped, obviously, really bad. Um, but there was parts of Manly and it was, um, you know, it was pretty bad. But, of course, I was... I was sending them photos of Pawanu because that's where my mum lives. And I was over there last week, you know, swimming in the surf a couple of times a day, you know, having a workout right on the beach. It was sunny. And yeah, well, they were, they were basically shoveling shit here. <laughs> so uh, with the uh, Hobbit, did mm. you actually advocate for that role that you got as Bomber? Or, like, did <clears> you even <throat> do an audition or what was the process? Yeah, yeah. I, I, no, totally. Because um, Pete Jackson didn't know me from, you know, Bar of Soap. So, oh, okay. um, but I was with... Um, you know, uh, at the time I, when I moved to, I moved to Australia in 2003 and before that I was with, um, Liz and Sarah at odd management in, in Auckland. Um, you know, I still keep in touch with them. Um, and at the time I remember going back and saying, Oh, look, maybe I should do some stuff in Australia and yeah, I could have an agent here as well. And I remember one of them saying, could have been Sarah saying, look, Oh, nah, it's, you know, it's too hard. Australia looks after New Zealand. But anyway, the Hobbit came up and I said to Liz, after Sarah had gone, I said, look, you know, I'm really, I'm interested. I'm hearing they're doing The Hobbit. You know, should we, 
hook back up, you know, as mm. an agent. And, uh, and she said, yeah, for sure. Um, so that's kind of how it came to pass. And then the audition came up um, in Auckland with Miranda Rivers, who, you know, that stage was working for uh, Liz Mullane, who's basically Pete Jackson's main casting director. Mm. And I just flew over there. I didn't even tell them I was based in Sydney because, you know, like here at the time, my agent at the time was my voice agent was doing my acting stuff, which was fine. I was getting, you know, she was really good and she got me a lot of work, many commercials and stuff. But I knew that I probably wouldn't even get a, t- get a test in Sydney because I'm, I just wasn't at that level. And, you know, the casting director, you know, I was going for maybe some really small stuff. Um, so I thought the best way to get cast would be to go by New Zealand. So I didn't tell them. I flew over, flew myself over, um, you know, booked myself into some shitty old, um, actually, what's it? it was that old sort of colonial style place on, in sort of morning, not Mornington. Um, Morningside? Morningside. No, yeah, the, like the other side on, uh, you know, you, you know, you come Kingsley? out of K, right? No, the other side. So you come out of K Road basically, and then you're going like north. You basically just keep going, and it sort of and it winds around to like eventually gets to the zoo. You know, um, Western Springs. The, yeah, so it's before it was before then. There was this old hotel that's still there, and I, I checked myself into that, um, and um, and I just did the did the audition. Um, I did like two takes. A friend of mine, um, Linda McFetridge, was she was working for Catch Casting at the time. And so I went in there and saw her and I did it and yeah, two takes. And that was pretty much it. I prepared a lot. My teacher in Sydney was like, you're going to be one of the most prepared. You know, well, I, I spent days. What did you did have to do? Well, like when you say prepare, what do you mean? Like, how do you even prepare? Well, like, well I mean, there was a script, right? And yep. there was a, basically all the guys who got cast as dwarves in New Zealand, we did one audition and it was for, it was basically um, uh, Gloin. So it was all Scottish. Um, so we had to prepare a script and it was a, a scene like with, and you like, when you watch the special features, you'll actually see they'll, they'll, they'll play the scene back. So it's not kind of no secret, but it was like a scene with a dwarf with Bilbo, you know, and, um, talking about wags, you know, you know, teeth like razor blades, you know, that kind of stuff. And so I, I had a mate who's from Glasgow. So I did all the Scottish, did the audition, did two takes. Um, he actually, my friend actually, um, one of the guys was helping me great guy called Dan Moore and um, and he's this Israeli guy and he used to be in the army and he's like just so focused really good actor as well and good trainer and he just said oh you need to get really roughed up and so I had this old like tunic that I made myself and a mate of mine um, we put together one year because in Sydney they do the city to surf which is like a run from you know the middle of the city to Bondi and he wanted to get dressed up as like Braveheart you know, so we we created this stuff with the face paint. Anyway, I had this old old costume, and he made me cut it, and it was all cut up and roughed up. And then my hair was like kind of like what it is now, and I just like just teased it right out, you know. Um, and anyway, and so when I got in the audition room, I had a jacket on, and then she goes, "Okay, let's go." And I took the jacket off, and then I was like <laughs> dressed like this, and she's like, "Whoa!" And uh, I remember thinking, "That's either a good wall or a bad wall." So. <laughs> You know what the hell and i did the tape and but i remember remember the end of it i remember walking out and there was someone there wait in a waiting room just like with a script just kind of like going through their script and like i've got a good chance if that's the level of preparation because like you know when you do acting work like the, the learning the words and the script is kind of like a runner putting on his shoes and doing up his laces that's kind of that's just the the, the fundamental part of it you know you learn your lines and then you then you work it and you you know you work out all the other stuff so you know and that was that was it and um didn't went you know spent a few days with my mum and dad over over in the coromandel and uh and then didn't hear anything for three months and then one day just got a phone call and uh it was like yep you've been cast as bomber so but i kind of knew i I knew i had a good shot i knew it was a good tape and i knew i'd worked hard and um and i and the other thing that really helped me was at the time, there was that Toyota ad, you know, with the flying fox. Yep, yep, remember. You know, and and it it it, it ended up winning like best ad on the, I think when they did the Fair Go Ad Awards, and the casting director at the time, she said, oh, you know, we've seen your ad, and you know, and so they they kind of knew who I was, and they saw me with my shirt off, and they were like, yeah, they go, yeah, that guy would make a great dwarf, and I, I was like, <laughs> shit, if I can't get cast looking like this as a dwarf, then I should just give up acting. Um, so I was. 
I was reasonably confident that something would come up. Um, but it was kind of weird because I know a lot of people got recalls and they, they got called in like two or three times. Like Adam Brown, who was cast as uh, Ori, he ended up, he auditioned for Bilbo. And that was at a time where Martin said he couldn't do it. Like Martin turned it down. Yeah, that's right. Sherlock. And, um, and then they went out and they cast it again. And then Pete was like, nah, that's my Bilbo. And he changed the whole schedule around so he could do it. But um, I know a couple of guys did it. And apparently he had a red, yellow, a red, orange, and green sort of thing. So either definitely yes, definitely no, or a maybe. And then you get recalls. And apparently my, my I just went, yep. <laughs> so, uh, <laughs> but, did you, reading the, but did you know which dwarf you're being cast for? No, but when I read the book, I was like, ah, oh, I bet they're gonna, I bet I'm gonna be the fat one. <laughs> <laughs> there was just something about it. I thought, oh, that's gonna be it. Um, and I knew he didn't have a lot of lines or anything. And as it turned out, I didn't have any, but uh, it kind of worked in my favor, I thought, um, because you're not having any like people really got the character and they love the character without any dialogue which, which is kind of like a nice challenge for an actor mm. because because really like the words are great and you do honor the script and you know that's it's a it's such a you know screenwriting is such such a craft and it's, it's constantly i mean the, a movie gets edited all the way through you know um especially this one i mean they call it the rainbow script because it always changes and i kind of like it because you just have to Things were changing, you know, depending on the, the different cast and what we brought to it, et cetera. Um, but be, to, to be able to people to get the character without me saying anything was great because to me it's all about point of view and, you know, it's all about what's going on in here and in, in your eyes rather than the actual words because anyone can say words, but it's got to be believable. So, yeah, I, I kind of like the idea. And, and also by – they actually gave me an option at one stage to, you know, look, we're thinking of making you a physical character, which means we'll take out your lines – and I remember um, Liz at the time, my agent, was like, well, just be careful. This is a big calling card for you. I said, look, yeah. I said, but do I want to be fighting with six other blokes for, you know, four or five lines? Or do I want to make them really memorable? And in the end, all the physical gags, like the barrel stuff and the running, and they just did a lot of physical stuff. And I really enjoy the physical comedy. I mean, I love the silent physical comedy. Um, Pete Jackson's actually like a massive fan of Buster Keaton, and he played a Buster Keaton oh. film when we were there. And I, I'd, I'd heard of him, but I hadn't, wasn't really exposed to him. And, and then I was like, ah, that makes sense now. Um, yeah, so the physicality of it. Well, it sounds like it would have been the sweetest gig because you get to work on this massive blockbuster. You don't have any mm. lines, so you just have to worry about the physical stuff. <clears throat> Plus you got all the mm. location stuff and you get to work alongside actors like um, Ian McKellen and Martin Freeman. Oh, it was, it, was, it was great. I mean, it was intimidating to start with. And I remember like the first few days or even before we started, I was really nervous because I was, you know, you, you have this whole um, imposter syndrome come in and like, you know, am I, mm. do I deserve to yeah. be here? Um, cause I, and I'd really never done a, a proper film before even. You know, I've done a few TV shows and, you know, I, I you know, had the odd thing on Shortland Street and Street Legal in New Zealand and, and I, I've done a few sort of support roles um, in Australia, like, you know, All Saints and a bit of Home and Away and stuff like that, but nothing of really any substance. Um, and this was massive. And it was such a different, it was such a, like, it was so big. And it took me a while, and also after it finished, to realise that's not normal. Like, that's not a normal actor's life. You, we don't usually get treated like that. You know, we got everything, and it was such a, a massive production with a big budget. It's, it's not usually how things go, but... Um, yeah, it was intimidating, but I guess after the first couple of the first few days on set, I mean, we spent six weeks together training because Pete was ill, so we had to push training, uh, yeah, push the shoot date about six weeks. So we got extra time. Um, so we got to know everyone, um, and Martin and, and Ian, and we'd go out, etc. But then once I started working, it was like, yeah, actually, no, I've, I've I've got this, and all my training because I trained in Meisner, and Meisner is all all about you know. Um, being truthful in imaginary circumstances, that's kind of, I mean, he says a lot of stuff, Sanford Meisner, but that's kind of the guts of it. So, you know, you imagine the circumstances and then you just have to react truthfully to it and react naturally, which comes in really handy when you're looking at a green screen, the same green screen, and you've got to make it a whole lot of different things. Um, so, yeah, like after a while, I got quite comfortable and I just thought I'm just going to do... I'm just going to have, you know, and my teacher always said, just have something to do. Like, you just be active, not try and overplay it. You don't want to overplay it. But just if, you, if you're really commit to doing something, 
even could be the little thing. And you, and what I, I chose to do was just eat. So, um, <laughs> you know, I, there'd be a level of respect because I, I, I sort of had Bomber as kind of one of the younger ones, but not as young as feeling Keely or Ori, but he wasn't far off them, you know, and then you had all the older ones. So there was a respect, you know, you didn't want to speak out of turn. Um, I mean, Biffa, Bofa and Bomber were basically the Bogans of Middle Earth. <laughs> You know, um, and being brought up in Upper Hutt and, being, you know, living in the Tron for a long time, I can definitely relate to it. You know, I, I had the karate shoes, I had the black jeans, I had the Ford Escort and I had the mullet, you know, so I had the whole, <laughs> the, the, I had the whole gambit living in Hamilton. Um, so, um, so I could kind of relate to it. And there was a confidence in a way, like he wasn't really overawed, but there was a bit of naivety and he was kind of respectful. Um, but all, all the important stuff that was happening wasn't quite as important as what was on his plate. And that's kind of the choice I made. So I was always kind of eating and looking and being respectful and then just like, you know, filling my gob. Mm. Um, yeah. And so, because I, sometimes you don't have a lot to do, but if you're on camera, you've got to like be alive. And even if it's just a really simple thing, you just commit to it and just do something simple and not overplay it. Anyway, that's, that's what I did. Do you have a specific location that you enjoyed shooting at the most? Oh, look, Bag End to start with was was magical. Oh, you know, yeah. Was, I've been that, there. That was, it's, it's it's crazy. Yeah. The set. Oh, look, but, yeah, but we never... The only time I actually went to um, actual Hobbiton, where the actual Bag End is, was the day after the, the world premiere when we did a whole lot of interviews, all these worldwide interviews. Um, but I used to live just over the hill from there. Um, in a little place called Richmond Downs out of Matamata. Oh, yeah, wow. In a former life. Yeah, with my uh, my outlaws have still got a farm there. Um, um, that's what I call my ex's parents. Um, <laughs> great people. Um, you know, sheep and beef farmers, you know, fr- fridge was, freezer was always full. But I used to live just over the, over the, uh, over the hill. So I, I was very familiar with the area. But yeah, that was the first time we got there. We shot all the bag end stuff they call it B stage and B stage is basically the old paint shed where they shot most of Lord of the Rings. Um, and it was, yeah. And it wasn't soundproof. It was just the paint shed. And so That's when right. we shot there, when we shot there, they had, an, you know, they all have their, you know, their radios. They had an AD and a deck chair on top of the hill, just telling them when the planes were coming in and out, just, just, just for sound. Is that still um, the same? Do they still have that problem or have they fixed that now? Uh, no, I, th- I think they still use that, but I, I only think I don't think they use that much now to yeah. film because it's problematic. But that was kind of that was the that was the stage where where you know bag end the set was, and we had a, a normal size set, then we had a miniature size set. So the miniature size set was for real in and our scale doubles because we had all scale doubles. Um, who yeah, were, of course. Know, the, yeah, the, you know, and um, so um, Sharon was mine. Um, she was great tough as and you know um so that was all set there for lord of the rings so it's kind of like a i guess um a bit of a historical thing and a sentimental thing to, to shoot in stage b um and then the other stage was a <clears throat> which was a proper sound stage and we did a lot of stuff in there as well we did a lot of the battle stuff in there um and then so they were pretty much the two stages they had for lord of the rings and then they built stage k which was for kong when when he did king kong and then I think there was stage C and D. There was two more stages. So we had like one, two, three, four big proper sound stages and then, then B. So that was good. I think the other one was the barrel riding, um, which, you know, that was a lot of components. Some of it, when we're going round and round, there was a big, um, it was about the size of a go-kart track and it was all water being pushed around. We were in the, in the barrels. And they'd, they'd built this huge thing with two V8 engines on either side, pushing the water around. And that was out at an old army base in Trentham. And so that's where they built that. Some of the stuff was on green screens. It's some, sometimes in the, in the barrel, excuse me, they were um, in shopping trolleys. Uh, they chucked a GoPro down the Hooker Falls at one stage. Um, and then the stuff where we'd sort of left the river and got out, that was the um, Polaris River, um, sort of between Nelson and, and, Mar- and um, Blenheim. So that was amazing. That was like a theme park ride. Um, yeah, so it looked cool. in the behind the scenes stuff, it looked like it too. Yeah, except it was bloody hot because with my suit and everything, I, I, you know, we had these cool vests, which is like the motor racing drivers use, and they're all refrigerated and then they plug it into an ice pack. Um, but because the water's freezing, 
I also had a wetsuit on underneath that. So I was just like, just get me in the bloody water. I'm cooking. I just need to get in the water. And so once I did, and we're in the barrels, and then I saw this, I saw the bubbles. I thought it must be the, the stunt divers underneath there. And then I looked down at my bloody barrel because it was a big, it had a huge like silver, you know, metal ballast at the bottom just to keep it, you know, upright. Then there's a barrel and inside the barrel, there's a like a tractor, you know, tie tube. And mine had sprung a leak. Um, luckily it didn't sink, <laughs> but there, there was a link in it. Um, yeah, but that, that was, that was pretty fun. So how, how was it like wearing the suit? I mean, was it very hard to move in it? Because you had a massive um, dwarf outfit. Yeah, look, mine was, I, I think a lot of people, I mean, I, I got a lot of sympathy for my suit. Um, a lot of it was unfounded, but I just, you know, I just let them do it anyway. Um, because my costume was actually really light. I had like a shirt and this, and a waistcoat most of the time. And the pants were the heaviest, but dry, they weren't too bad. And I had the braces. Um, when, they, when I got wet, like stepping out of the barrel with the pants and the suit, I never weighed myself, but I think one of my stunt guys, um, I just, my original stunt guys, his name's Bronson Steele, um, which is such a great movie name. He's based in Auckland. And he was my stunt guy on that Toyota ad as well, with the flying ah. box. Yeah, that was hilarious when I, when I ran into him the first, first time. Um, and I think it was either him or Marky Lee Campbell, who's, who's Australian based, who took over when Bronson went to another job. But um, we, um, he weighed himself and it was like 185 kilos. And that's, I remember getting up wet, soaking wet, and I need four guys to lift me up and I had to walk up the bloody hill. They left me there. Um, but, uh, but when it was dry, the costume itself wasn't that heavy. And all the foam, basically what they did is like the forearm was one piece, the, the upper arm was another piece. Um, same with the calves and the quads and then the bum. They were all separated. And then they were, they were connected by like a, quite a thick strip of like, um, sort of like a, you know, um, that sort of sewing elastic, you know, that sort of material, elastic material. And they were buttoned because they needed to have the gaps. They needed to be able to move. It couldn't just be one full suit. Everything was like individual muscle groups. And so that way, that, that way it looked more natural. And it also meant that we could run and we could do whatever. Like we had bum and we had, you know, all the leg stuff. And sometimes we'd take our forearms off just to let it breathe. I'd have my moobs, my man boobs, I'd have that. Um, and then we'd have like, you know, shoulder or whatever. It would be pretty basic. Um, and then at the very end, they'd put my stomach on, which was a whole se one separate piece, like a great big block of bloody cheese. It was like, like, a, like a small moon. And I'd put that on just before we stepped on set. Um, so, yeah, I, it wasn't so bad. Um, like the prosthetics, like the hands and all that took a little while to get used to. Because I remember at the start, there was so... It was really constricting. Um, but the great thing with all the costume and prosthetics and all of them, like when we did our test, I was like, shit, I don't know if I can stay in this. And I think they even put like a thing of lycra over top of it because they were worried about showing all the muscles. Um, but they just kept adjusting. Like they'd take our feedback because we had to wear it all day. Um, and in the end, we had stunt gloves, which meant that instead of all massive sausages, of because it was all silicon, right? Um, that actually there'd be mesh on the inside. So we could actually hold and we could fight because you can't fight with those, you know, if it's all. Yeah. Know. Yeah. Yeah. Cause I was wearing those when I had to catch the sausage in, in um, Rivendell and cause it was all like Silicon, a greasy sausage gets thrown at me. I'll catch them. Just, <laughs> just like, <laughs> so um, there were challenges, but yeah, they were really good and they, they'd make adjustments and they'd make sure we were comfortable and obviously safe. That's the main thing. So, so what would yeah. be like some of the direction Peter Jackson would give you? Um. Oh, look, you know, he, he, he had a lot of fun, you know, and he used to call us, we used to call us the little bastards. That was his name for us. And I've actually got a sweatshirt that goes, I am a little bastard that he gave us. And he thought it was, he thought it was hilarious. He's a bit of a joker um, because there were so many of us, he couldn't, you know, and we probably couldn't remember everyone's names. You go, and he'd, he'd go, okay, let's, let's get the little bastards. Let's get the little bastards out. And we'd, we'd turn up on set. Um but, you know, we do like a lot of takes. And I think Pete kind of let, let us do, and, you know, it was mainly for the league guys. They'll, they'll let them do it. And then eventually after, he'll kind of get what he wants towards the end. Um, but, um, you know, he, he'd, he'd, be, he'd be in his tent watching the screens, like the voice of God, we call it. 
Um, sometimes, you know, he, he, he obviously he'd come out and talk to us as well. But a lot of times, if we're up high somewhere, it's just easier to be in there in the monitors just to to do it. But um, you know, he, he just he'd be very. Uh, I mean, one time we we're up meant to be. It was when all the uh, the stone giants were there. He goes, oh yeah, so you guys are. Um, yeah, you're up there at the mountain and, uh, you know, you can see these stone giants and there's quite a bit of, uh, oh, we'll, we'll turn the wind on actually. And, uh, and uh, you know, you're looking around and this thing's quite amazing. And, uh, and this is one of these massive studios. I guess, oh, yeah, uh, and it's raining. <laughs> and then the rain started, these massive sprinklers, and we got soaked. And I, re I remember Ken Stott because he was like, he'd have to go, oh, look, there's this, there's the stone giants. And they had the wind going and he had that big, like, hook. Yeah. I don't know if you remember. Yeah. yeah Balin yeah and it was so funny and they could never get it i think they had to do it there was a one guy who did all the post-production who just looked after the hair and he because he go oh look there's a <laughs> you know and the, and the and the beard and they go okay do, do, this, do another take and he go ah right okay here we go look there's a you know and his beard would just flick up over his face which i think pete found hilarious um at one stage uh, we were in the goblin caves um and the Goblin King um, was Barry Humphreys, you know, Dame Edna yep. himself. Um, and he was fantastic. He was so great. And he'd be there doing offlines, you know, like usually most actors, you know, do offlines, but some sort of don't, you know, <laughs> that they just do their bit and go away, and you know, they go, it's, go home. Yeah. Yeah. It just depends. But like most people I work with do or do that. And, but he was fantastic. He was so supportive. And I remember one time he came, he, he came over to me all worried and just made sure I was, you know cool and you know he, he was he was really good a real pro but we we're doing that goblin scene and mark hadlow has always been like the full guy <laughs> for, for pete jackson because you know pete loves mark hadlow because he's worked with him so many times on kong and you know pretty much everything he's done you know yeah yeah and and um so uh, you know we'd always tease the shit out of him and the thing about it is that he'd always re react to it which which is silly because that makes you that do it more. Yeah. Thanks. You know, and a good mate of mine always said, you know, like if with practical jokes, you know, if it just, if enough's enough and people are starting to get pissed off with it and it's just not funny anymore, that's when you really need to up it, you know, up the ante and ram it home. And I know with Hadlow once we were in the goblin caves and he sent Kieran Shah, who was originally, he was Frodo's double. And he's done a lot of stuff. He's worked on so many movies, Kieran. He's tiny, you know. Um, and Pete sent him out to hump his leg like a dog, <laughs> like, like a dog, <laughs> you know. And, and, you know, so he had a good sense of humor. And we'd do, we'd do shit like that with him. I remember the, I could have been in the third movie where we put the armor on. We're looking for the armor for the big battle. And um, William Kircher had a hammer and he was bashing his like helmet. And Dean Naden thought it'd be funny just to like steal his hammer. <laughs> and so they go action and he goes looking around for his hammer and then he just ends up just punching it with his fist which was actually a lot funnier um and i, I guess the, the one that i remember pete's direction was when we did the big running you know from bayorn in in the second movie oh yes which was which turned out to be like such an iconic scene and i remember you know we'd gone for a bit of a walk before you know the day before a bit of a bush walk and you know because we did a lot of training um but no one sort of goes, oh, look, in three days' time, you're going to be running, so you need to be prepared. And you just have to read the script, look at the schedule, kind of predict, and really be ready for anything. And that's why we did such – we did a lot of fitness training beforehand. Yeah. Um, you just got to be ready. And if you're not, then they'll just get a stunt guy to do it, and, you know, that, what would you, you would lose your close-up. So <clears throat> I saw this. I thought, this, I think this is going to be quite a big moment. And I didn't know how they are going to shoot it. Anyway, we did some stuff running down the hill and I had to kind of put a bit of pace on. And then we did this massive running moment and there was the buggy and I could tell it was going to be close. And he goes, okay, this is, you're going to be running, you know? And I'm like, right. Um, and I asked the camera guys, I said, can you see my feet? And they're like, no, you can't. I go, great. So I asked the costume team to go and get my runners because we had those, we had these massive boots. They were like big costume boots and inside them were these like black, you know, soft black boots that we actually that we wore but they're really bad to run in and a lot of the other guys had their boots on so i was like if i'm gonna get a competitive advantage i need to have my runners so they got them and we end up only doing like three takes and i i, I clearly remember it and pete's like <clears throat> right you guys uh, you're running from bayon and uh you know he's he's a bear he's you know it's pretty dangerous life or death and uh so i want you to go fast don't don't pretend 
to run fast because it's going to look silly. I want you to really go as, as fast as you can. Um, you know, just really, really go for it. And uh, Stephen, you, uh, you, uh, you just run faster. Action. <laughs> <laughs> and that was it. And, and I just, I bolted. And I'm pretty sure because, you know, like I, I've never been, you know, elf-like. Um, I'm pretty sure a lot of people were like, this is going to be interesting. How's this guy going to run? Um, but, you know, in the true nature of dwarfs, you know, I'm very, very fast over two, three meters, you know, so this was a lot longer. But I, I just fanged it, basically. And we did three takes and we got it. And the look on their faces was, was real, you know. Um, so that was pretty fun. But it was like as an acting, as an actor and an acting coach, it sort of really, you know, just confirmed to me that you just have to be prepared for anything. And if you're not, that's fine. They will make it work. Like they'll, they'll make it work for the film, but you kind of get those moments. I mean, it's very, very Eminem, isn't it? You know, you get one shot and, um, you know, so if you don't take it, then, then that shot was gone. I mean, if I was injured, for example, or I couldn't run fast enough, then they would have done something different. It could have been a wide shot. They would have used digital or I don't know how they would have done it, but you know, I'm, I'm glad that I was prepared for it. And because, uh, yeah, it turned out to be probably one of my best moments in the trilogy. So, so like when you're training up and coming actors, what's some of the advice you mm. give them? What's the common mistake um, that you feel that a lot of actors make? I, I, I think, I think probably the common mistake is they just give up. Um, or they, like in they terms of the career, expect, in terms of the, the yeah, 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 yeah. Or, or, or they just expect things to happen. You know, I want to get an agent now. It's like, well, it actually takes a while. Um, and also, you know, I've, I've just created this with my um, business, The Actors Coach. I've created this um, online program. And it's basically an app called The Acting Confident Six-Week Challenge. And, and I just thought there's a whole lot of stuff that I've learned over the last sort of 20 years that generally as actors, we just learn by trial and error. Um, and I'm like, well... I'm not going to say, look, this is the way and, you know, profess to be the master or, you know, this is the right way. Cause there's so many different, you know, and I said, look, the other thing too, is that you can, you, you go have other coaches and you do other classes and you do other, other things and someone will have a different take on it. You really have to work out your own way. And I think one of the main things is that you have to take responsibility as an actor for your own career, which means, and it's like any business, like treat it like a business. If there's things that you don't know or you're not skilled in, you upskill yourself or you get someone on your team. And I talk a lot about building a team of people who can assist like with that. Like, a, you know, if you've got things with your voice, uh, like a specific voice coach or, you know, accent coaches, like a good accountant, um, you know, have, do classes so you can regularly work out. It's like a, going to the gym, you, like you need to be working scenes, you need to be breaking scenes down because you need to get quick at it. You need to be at a point where someone can send you an audition request and in two days you need to turn it around. Um, but that's not going to happen straight away. Um, so I, I, I think it's, you know, a lot of people get stopped by the no because it is a crazy business where, you know, it, it attracts people who we're quite open, we wear a heart on our sleeves, you know, we can be quite sensitive, you know, because you need to be as an actor, you need to be very open and vulnerable. And then the nature of the business is it's mostly rejection, you know? Um, yeah, well, that's right. <clears throat> and it's, and I, I guess, I guess that's probably the main thing. Like, you know, don't see those obstacles as failures. It, just see it as development. Um, do you think, and if you're, uh, sorry, I was just going to ask, do you think some, no, no. some of it is a delusional aspect due to the Hollywood aspect of it? You know, they see that and it can give mm. them an unrealistic expectation. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. You know, and, and I experienced that because, you know, I, I had a, I, there was a small window when we did this and we did all the promotion, especially where it's just like, you know, you get talked up and, and you kind of believe all the hype. And I did, um, you know, <laughs> it's hard not to like it. Honestly, it's hard not to, Oh, like you'll be doing this. And, you know, um, I went from sort of naught to zero. I mean, you know, not to a hundred, like in, in, in such a short time. And then when I came back to Australia, I had to kind of start from here again and build, build and build my agent was like over here they said look you know i know you did the hobbit and they made billions of dollars and you know it was a big promotion you've done all that thing he said but at the end of the day we never saw your face and you didn't say anything so no one's going to go oh i'm going to get that guy as a lead role in this project because i was a non-talking mostly physical kind of character mm. um so 
and you can never see my face. But I think people do, you know, I think you, you, you want to, people should question why they want to do it um, and really just enjoy the process and enjoy, you know, it, it was a few years ago, I really came to the conclusion that as an actor, it's, that's my creative outlet. And we all, we're all creative in some way. Some people cook, some people play music, some people write, you know, some people build stuff. Some people just want to tinker around with cars, you know, um, or be in the garden. And that's all a form of creativity. It, 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 it's that, that's a creative expression, but all that kind of stuff. And, you know, to me, I think enjoying that and do, doing something you really enjoy is like paramount. Because if you're trying to do it for the end result of like to get into Hollywood and famous, I mean, some people do, you know, I mean, I think I started as an actor, if we want to get really psychological about it, when I was living in Morrinsville and at school, uh, acting was something I was good at, and it got me kind of accepted in school, you know, um, got people to like me, and that's fine. I mean, I, I know that now. <laughs> I've done enough, done enough, you know, work and, and stuff to, uh, to figure out that's kind of how it started, but it, I ended up pretty good at it, and it's, it's something I do enjoy. So, because otherwise you're just going to struggle and struggle and struggle trying to get somewhere. Whereas, you know, if you're enjoying, you know, that's why I say do plays, do short films. And if it's something you enjoy, then the, you're going to have a much higher chance of actually getting success. Um, and it's kind of like why with my, I, you know, my, this online course, I, I called it like the acting confident because it was to give people confidence. And the way of doing that is to, it's just to fill in the knowledge gaps because I've learned so much over the years and, and you realize that even like some of the big schools or even people have got agents, there's just so much they don't know. And by, you know, and that affects the confidence. If you don't quite don't know, if you don't know where you're at or you don't know if, if, if it's good or if it's bad um, or, or there's just little tricks that, that are, you know, going to make your job easier. Um, and, you know, I didn't call it the get an agent course or the book a job course because I can't guarantee that. And yeah, it takes a yeah. lot of work. It's like a, you know, like all these, all these things where, you know, you can make all this money or, you know, crypto or share market or whatever, like they'll give you the, the tips. But most of these things that are really legitimate require an awful lot of work. So you've got to be prepared to put the work in, you know. Um, and, you know, I guess the other thing is just don't let people tell you that you can't do it. You know, if you really want to do it, identify where you're at, identify you know, what level you're at now, identify the skills you need to develop and just do it, you know, invest the time, invest the money and, you know, and put the work in. And, um, you know, I mean, there, there's an awful lot involved, but, um, you know, even just going doing local theatre or, you know, doing a short film and like nowadays, I mean, when I was at school in the 80s, you know, cameras were so expensive um, and you needed someone with the proper editing gear. Whereas now pretty much you've got a phone, you can make a film. Yeah. Totally. So, so, so the means uh, have, have really, really improved. Well, there's also been a paradigm shift, I suppose, in terms of the creative arts. Like if you think of how Netflix is now and you have motion capture and voice acting, like voice acting and say like video games and video games mm. is like a huge medium. So you have a lot of different outlets now, not mm. just like say theater or television yeah. or film. Yeah. Totally, and I do a lot of voice work. I mean, I've, that, that's I'm going to see this. That's my little voice studio. In oh, there. nice. That's yeah, that's well I, hidden. Yeah, yeah, and um, and so obviously over the lockdown, it's been brilliant. And I'm, I've, I've got to when we finish this, you know, in, in about forty five minutes, I've got a, I've got a voice job with someone in Adelaide, I think, and um, and uh, I've got Source Connect, which is kind of like a it means whatever I do in my studio, they can record on their end. Yeah. and I got my microphone and and all that kind of stuff, and. You know, I think even for creativity, a lot of I, I teach a bit of voice over at um, at some schools around Sydney, and you know, I'm not the most technical, you know, proficient engineer, but um, a lot of what I tell them is, look, you know, you can get into the voice industry because it does pay well if you do voiceovers, but also, you know, audio wise, like you're doing with your podcast, it's it's a lot cheaper to set up doing audio than it is to do video, and like totally. now you can record Zoom, you know, and and who's to say that you can't, you know, you can do your short film, you just get a whole lot of actors and friends and you record it and you just see how it pans, it pans out. I mean, I did a, I met a bloke the other day, this Irishman, and he's got a great film script that he wants me to do. And he just wanted me to record it. And I read the whole thing in there. Like it took me a couple of hours, but then he had it and he could listen to it 
and just to just to get an idea and he could send that to people because his concern was that people aren't reading scripts anymore so you send them the audio version so look there's so much you can do so i encourage oh. anyone who's creative to, to to actually get your own get just get your own gear i mean you know like the microphone i've got i've got a sennheiser and it's like you know it was 1500 bucks 10 years ago so that's that's on the higher end but you know this one here that's i've got a little road you know and that, that came off an old camera that i had um and you just get one of these and it's it's pretty simple to set up i mean my i don't know if you can see it but my my audio whoops that's well oh, no, you can't quite it's all plugged in um but my audio interface it's like 150 bucks and you get a little you know headphone amp if you need it um it's pretty it's pretty simple and um well you only need to buy really, it once as well yeah yeah totally yeah, yeah. and like and, and and there's so many great programs too i, I use the rx7 like the isotope program oh yep and, and, i use that yep it's yeah, amazing kinds of things yeah um and there's another one a friend of mine sent me um i can't remember what it is but it was it was like i think it's a free program or it's it's like ridiculously cheap um so yeah you know i i, th I think that's a that's a good way of uh of getting started and um you know have you actually done like some video game stuff because i i haven't done no, i've done a lot of, i've done a bit of animation video game stuff is is very i oh, actually i did some stuff recently it was for a cricket game um it's not terribly high paying oh isn't um, it and the, no and That's the, the thing was but what well it is like if you do it in the in us and you're part of i know guys who do um like mocap stuff i'm friends with a bloke called nolan north who any gamers are probably know yeah. nolan yeah um yeah. one of the funniest men i've ever met and really, really good bloke but obviously he does a lot of that stuff <clears throat> and i went to the studio um actually i stayed with graham mctavish it was before the first movie came out and um i went to naughty dog which is the company that do uncharted yeah. games and i went i went to the studio in culver city and you know saw where they did all that um and you know that's a different level, obviously. You know that's 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 pretty good. And and I know it's a massive industry in LA, the video, the gaming industry, um, in you know in terms of how many projects and and the money that churns through it. But you know it's kind of based in Australia. It's sort of on the lower end. Um, and the other thing with with doing gaming is usually you do it and they have it in perpetuity, which basically means you do it once and they've got it forever. Um, whereas with a commercial, <clears throat> like. Um, so if I did a TV commercial, I do a lot for New Zealand, actually. And I, I go in the studio, I do a TV commercial, um, and it'll probably play on the internet as well. And they take that usage, 30 seconds. It might take me half an hour. That's like 1200 bucks. Um, but then if they want to use it after six months or after 12 months, I've got to pay for that again. And there's that uh, rollover thing. Right. Yeah. That's yeah. interesting. Because obviously, like, mm -hmm. video games grosses more than film and television combined. That's part of the reason why I was, I was curious. Um, yeah. And it seems like yeah. Peter Jackson's heavily investing into that stuff now with Unity and yeah, and, yeah. Look, and, and I, it, I think I, they're kind yeah. of colliding, like visual mm. effects in terms of yeah, film. I, I think yeah, games. I think it's interesting. But and and from that, but but it's good. And I, I can know the gaming stuff. And you know, there's a lot of agencies now, online voice agencies. They do a lot of that kind of work. A lot of it is audition based, which means you need your own, your own studio and you need your own setup, and you can audition to pick up jobs. <clears throat> the traditional model of voiceovers that I'm involved with, with EM Voices, my, my agent here, like they'll email me and just go, you have a job booked, bang, and it's that's done. That's cool. So I don't, I, I don't have to audition. So that's the traditional model. And yesterday I went and I did a like a, a radio ad for Australia and I actually went into a studio for the first time in about two years. So um, that was exciting. Um, but yeah, like it's a lot more accessible now for people to get into the voice industry because totally. there's a lot of online ones. I mean, there's a, like I just signed up in New Zealand to word of mouth, which is a, you know, traditional, um, probably the top voice agent um, in New Zealand that, you know, just for New Zealand based work, you know, out of the agencies there. But there's another one I looked at called Big Mouth. Um, Sarah McLeod runs it and she actually played Rosie Cotton in the Lord of the Rings. Um, oh, bit, yes. Yes. <clears throat> and, and I looked at their website as well, but they, 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 their model's kind of more online and they do a lot of, I know guys who are on that as well as my agent here and they, you know, they go for gaming things and, but there's a lot more auditioning involved. So, <clears throat> but I, I think the, the, the first thing is just find, like I noticed your, the little arm that you use for, um, yeah, like that. Yeah. Uh, I mean, you know, I worked in radio for years and they were bloody expensive, but I picked one up for like 40 bucks on eBay. Um, and it's not a really expensive one, but it's totally workable. And I've got my Sennheiser. I use it in, in my booth there. So, yeah, I think like all my gear is under a thousand dollars, maybe. 
Yeah. Easy. Yeah. 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 And you can do it for cheaper too. Like, you know, oh, yeah, you, you can. You it can just go. depends. It, it's like, you know, it's, I used to sell wine, um, you know, and over the phone. And it's kind of like, it's a bit like wine. Like the more, the more you learn about it, the, 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 the you know, the more your tastes improve um, and then the more money you end up spending. So, uh, you know, but you can get a basic setup just to get yourself going. And then you go, actually, my, I need a, I need a better quality microphone or I need a better quality audio interface or, or what have you. Mm. Um, I, I think the main thing with a lot of it, especially with voice work is really just finding, it's just getting a, like a reasonable sound. I, I've done a lot of voiceovers from my mum's house in New Zealand, from hotel rooms. I just put, used to, I put a chair on a bed and just whack some pillows around it in a blanket. And, and that, that's, that's a voice booth, you know? Um, and nowadays with all the technology, you can get a, get rid of all the out, outdoor sounds and stuff like that. So, yeah. Yeah, because I've I've heard your voiceovers and they sound mm. so so good. So like like the ones on your website, for example, were they all done mm. in that room? No, I think most of those were probably done in, in bigger studios. Right. Um, but 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 some have been done here, you know. Um, so yeah, um, yeah. I, I, there's a lot more have been done here. Like I do all my I do audio books in here, and I just edit them myself. I mean, I, I, like I'm an engineer. When I started at Kiwi FM in Hamilton, that's when I started you know, being a recording engineer. Um, that was all on tape. I used to splice stuff. There used to be yeah. a, music, a music store called Tracks, which was the music store in town. And um, I used to edit music beds and stuff like that using tape and splicing and all kinds of stuff. So I've got Pro Tools. Um, I'm just like on a subscription membership and it's not cheap, but it's, you know. I need well, it's the system. industry standard, isn't it? So. <clears throat> well, it is. And, yeah. and, and also, I, I, and I need to be able to save my files and save my folders. And every time I get a voice job, I just do that and I, I send stuff off. I've got some regular clients I do. So I do quite a bit. So how do, you, how do you deal with like the fact that I suppose with any type of creative person is you don't have the standard nine to five, right? You can have heaps mm. of work and then all of a sudden have nothing. And then, yeah. like, has that ever oh, happened to you? Oh, yeah, heaps. Um, you know, and I, I think my last real job was, I mean, I worked at the Wine Society in Sydney selling wine for a bit and that was kind of regular, but that was still part-time. And I still, I ducked off, you know, for voice jobs and acting jobs. And it's a real balance, like as an actor to try and, because you, you need to sustain yourself. You don't want to be desperate for money. You've got a, you, you've got a roof over your head and you've got to be able to feed yourself to start with and keep warm and clothed. You know, there's the, ba the basic essentials of life. Um, so finding a, an employer or a secondary job, um, which is mostly your primary job <laughs> when you're acting, um, that is flexible enough for you to pursue your creative dreams is really important. And preferably you want, you want something that's, that's sympathetic and that's supportive of your, of your creative dreams. So yeah, it's always a balance. Um, but I always think, I, I, I used to work in Tokoroa, um Radio Forestland, and I remember learning this because Kinley Pop and Paper Mill was there. And they always used to say that, um, you know, if Kinley um coughed the whole town caught a cold and they were so reliant and there's a lot of small towns that are very reliant on one industry and then suddenly they're closed and then they're then the evil people because they've closed but it's like a town needs to be reliant on more than one industry totally otherwise it's, it's like you know my whole philosophy in life is like you know i'm responsible i'm 100 responsible for every single thing that happens to me um otherwise i'm just a victim so um as far as my business is concerned i've got my voiceovers I've got my acting and now I've got my coaching and my coaching has mainly been one-on-one, -on -one, but now it's going scalable with my online course. And I'm gone at the moment. I'm in the process of automating it and, you know, just having it passive income. So, so regardless what happens with my, you know, I'm still committed to doing acting work, but I'm not desperate and I'm not, you know, it, you know, I've got a family, I've got, I've got an 11 year old. It goes to a school that requires fees. So, you know um, I think it's really important to have a few things on the go you know, not like a jack of all trades. You want to be able to specialize in something, but you know, when when one thing is is when voiceovers down, acting's up, or when when they're both down, coaching's up, and vice. You know, there's always I've got something to rely on. I wouldn't have too many because you don't want to spread yourself too thin. But you know, if you're able to have two or three three sort of forms of um, of income um, in this kind of industry, that is so sporadic because, like, I'm an actor, but I, I don't I, most of the time I'm not on set. I'm doing other things. Um, and, you know, and I, I guess I'm, you'd probably call reasonably successful. I've, I've done a lot of work and, you know, I, I'm not working wall to wall. 
<laughs> you know, just uh, you know, uh, some people I know are, and that's fantastic. Um, but um, plus, I've got a family. You know, I, I'm, I, that's why I haven't gone to America. People, you know, they go, oh, "We wouldn't go away there and do this job and go to the states." And if you're going to go to the states, the, the thing about going to America is that. A, well, you need either a green card or an O-1 visa. And in the O-1 visa, you can only work as an actor or in that industry. Like you can't just oh. go and do bar work. No, you, like, so you need, it needs to be sustainable. So I, I, I'm not going to leave my family and go to LA. It's just, it's just not feasible for me. Well, um, it's, quite, it's, quite, it's getting quite difficult to get a green card now, isn't it? Yeah, I think the O-1 visa has tightened up a little bit as well. Um, and, you know, to me, that's a young person's game. You know, you're young, single, go over there, do what you need to do um, and break in and good luck to you and i know a lot of people a lot of young people who do that in fact in australia there's a lot of people who are barely known here and then suddenly they make it big um like it was the guy dacra montgomery who was in um stranger things you know he oh. played like the you know the real cool looking kid you know um is he i've never heard of him yeah he's australian i've never oh, heard wow. of him you know and um but anthony lapali was like that i mean i know he was reasonably successful here and he did lantana but he went to america very young and did a lot of stuff over there and he just he told everyone he was from new york you know um i think <laughs> or new jersey or something so that's kind of how he went well even chris Hemsworth, so, yeah. right obviously he's australian and he's he's massive he's thor oh yeah so, yeah I, I i worked with chris hemsworth the first time was um on uh on Home and Away, like years ago, when um, oh, really? Beck Cartwright, when, when Beck Cartwright was still on it, yeah, and I was yeah. playing some bailiff on some episode, and you know he was just this young, young sort of fresh-eyed chap, and uh, yeah, he's he's done remarkably well, and you know he's doing some good things with Netflix, and yeah, he's producing stuff as well. So, uh, one of my a couple of my friends worked on a movie that he produced, and his wife started actually, so she's a very good actor. Mm. I actually think Australia's better than america anyway i think yeah look you know i i think it's it's, it's the in kind terms of thing of that's, uh, yeah yeah i oh, totally like i think so like if you really want to be working in hollywood then you need to be in in, in la you know like if you're constantly doing stuff but you know like over the last couple of years they've all come to australia or new zealand anyway um you know uh like australia is good because i mean new zealand's got some good studios there there's wellington there's auckland there's obviously cumu that's open yeah um but you know, here, like each state's got a very thriving industry. I mean, F Fox Studios are basically Marvel now um, for, for, the, for the foreseeable future. Um, so Sydney's actually lacking a little bit in the big studio space now. Um, but you've got the Gold Coast Studios, there's studios in Brisbane. Adelaide's got like an amazing... I've been in Adelaide like every year for the last five years. I did Wanted, I did Escape from Pretoria with Daniel Radcliffe. I did... Um, uh, what else did I do? There was... Uh, oh, I did Wolf Creek Series 2. Uh, and mo more recently, I did a show called The Tourist, which was a BBC um, stand production. Um, and th they've got a great setup. Melbourne's got great um, setup there. I did The Leftovers, I think, over there. And they're always doing big productions. My mate Graham McTavish was over there doing Preacher, but they came to, to, to Melbourne for a bit. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a good setup. And I've got a friend of mine who's actually working with the local government up in Queensland, setting up a, um, a stew up in Townsville or Cairns or something like you know somewhere up north in the far north queensland so wow you know yeah so there's lots of options and there's more work in australia so of course yeah right. that's yeah. why so many kiwis moved to australia right? <laughs> exactly <laughs> yeah and of course we go straight to bondi like i did in 2003 and live by the beach it's like woo. <laughs> so where are you living bondi of course you are <laughs> <laughs> yeah well bondi's beautiful though so yeah yeah it's awesome hmm. well hey um i won't keep you because I know you got other things uh, to do, but thank you so much for taking time out. I very much appreciate awesome. it. Yeah. No worries, man. It's so um, if anyone wants to sign up to your acting course, what's the best way mm. of them going about it? Um, well, they can probably just go to um, theactorscoach.com.au. Yep. Um, all one word. Um, and usually what I do is I just, you know, anyone who's interested, I just do a free 15 minute chat. And if they're interested in like the, um the online course uh, i can just send them an application form which is all online as well <clears throat> take them through it answer a few questions and then you know we can have another we can have another chat and go into that in detail and if i think it's something that's right for them because you know like it's not a insignificant investment um if mm -hmm. i think it's something that's going to really benefit them and, and they're, they're in the zone for it then yeah i can set them up and the beauty of it is it takes like 30 minutes a day um it's all you can do it all on your phone um you watch a video you do a type form 
you know so a lot of it is about filling the knowledge gap and also just getting you know where you're at because you can't I'm, i had a great manager in a radio station it was in new plymouth actually who told me you can't manage what you don't measure and it really sat with me um and so quite often we don't even know where we're meant to be or if we're you know and a lot of i teach a lot of people and they, and they go actually you're in the right place right now and maybe you can work on this but you're actually going fine so even just you know getting clear on on where they're at so i can do that and then we'll have another chat and see where that takes us yeah and if anyone wants to hire you for anything oh well yeah <laughs> totally they can they can email me totally <laughs> yeah absolutely i'll put them onto my agent um and i, I do video messages too on cameo so um, oh that's nice one of the other Yep. That's the other little thing. And that was really busy during lockdown, actually. That was... Uh, that yeah, was, I bet was it was. Busy. Yeah. Yeah. And I think at the moment, I think I've signed up to 50% of all that goes towards um, flood relief. I think. Oh, cool. So, uh, yeah, because it's been pretty pretty shit over here lately with the with weather. So. Yeah, well, that's right. That's right. You guys can't catch a break, it no. seems. Mm. No. Cool. Well, Stephen, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much again. That is the awesome. Yeah, that is the show, everyone. Make sure you share, like, and subscribe. And until next time, stay safe.